think we'll go ahead and start. I'll try to keep my eye on the anybody who might need to be let in. Okay, welcome to Great Decisions. Tonight's topic, China in Africa. You want to advance the slide, Rick? Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. I'd like to thank tonight's sponsors, the Franklin Public Library Foundation, Jerome J. and Dorothy H. Holtz Family Foundation, Carol and Tom Donovan, in memory of Doris Sargent. These are our major sponsors. Tonight, we'll be talking about China and Africa and how this will work. If you could just keep yourself muted during the presentation, it will um, help the enjoyment of everybody. During the presentation and after, if you think of a question you would like to ask, just type it in the Zoom chat box. We will read questions in the order they are received after the speaker is finished, as time allows. The program will end no later than 8 p.m. While your question is being discussed, you can unmute yourself to discuss it with the speaker but then please mute again when you are finished. One question per attendee, unless time allows for more than one question. So I'll just introduce our speaker. Rick Rakamura is a former VP and general manager of Cooper Power Systems in Shanghai, China. During his time in China, Rick and his wife, Joan, studied Chinese language, history, and culture, and traveled all over China. He is a lecturer for the School of Continuing Education at UW-Milwaukee. This is his first appearance at Franklin Public Library's Great, Dis Great Decisions discussion series. So I'd like to uh, turn this over to Rick. Well, thank you, Jennifer, and welcome everybody this evening to Great Decisions. Uh, the topic tonight is uh, China and Africa. Every spring, Great Decisions has eight topics of interested to to, uh, to all citizens of the United States and um, um, tonight tonight the subject is is China and Africa it's, if you're not really familiar with the subject it seems kind of a, a off the, off the beaten path topic but apparently this week in the uh, congressional hearings and for the United Nations uh, representative that was one of the questions that she was asked about is how the United States should counter China's huge investment in Africa so let's go through this tonight. I have about a 30 minute slide presentation. And at the end of the, uh, it's based on the briefing book from Great Decisions. There's a briefing book available. And at the end of the briefing book article about China and Africa, there's a series of questions posed, which I reproduced here and we can discuss them or anything else you want to discuss. So I, I lived in China for 10 years and um, Towards the end of my time in China, Africa became part of our business that we were doing from China. So let's go through this today. Um, China's not new to Africa. In fact, most people don't know, but China, a Chinese uh, maritime sailor visited Africa and coast in 1413. His name was Zheng He, it's pronounced Zheng He. And he was a very famous admiral during the Ming Dynasty that sailed around the Indian Ocean and uh, apparently came back from Africa with exotic animals like giraffes and tigers to present to the emperor in China. But after Zheng He's voyages, which were quite legendary and they're commemorated around Southeast Asia, uh, the Ming Dynasty stopped its outward expansion. Um, but the, China reemerged in Africa in 1955 as part of the Bandung Conference. Bandung is a city in Indonesia. And in 1955, there was the non-aligned movement had uh, a, a meeting in Bandung and uh, African nations who were trying to throw off colonialism were present. There are also some US civil rights activists present and China was present. And this is a picture of uh, 
Joe and Lai at the Bandung Summit. This is Nasser from Egypt at the summit. These are leaders from, uh, from Ethiopia and, and, uh, and uh, Zambia that were also present at the summit. And China emerged, there were 29 countries that attended, and this is the beginning of the non-aligned movement. And China emerged as a major supporter of, of the anti-colonial struggle in the world. Uh, China's principles of foreign policy are very important, uh, and they're a little different than the United States principles. China uh, advocates non-interference in domestic affairs of other countries, and probably one of the main reasons they do this is they don't want any uh, other foreign countries, particularly the United States, interfering in their domestic affairs. So this is a principle of Chinese uh, foreign policy. They won't be telling uh, other countries about lecturing them about human rights or corruption or other, other things that might be distasteful. Uh, this China strongly supports anti-colonial movement. They, they feel that they were victimized by colonialism. They support other countries' attempts to, uh, to uh, ward off colonialism. So they share this uh, feeling of victimization by Western powers. And China has focused on assistance to African development. It really started in, at that Bandung conference. And the big, first big project that China was involved in in Africa is called the Tazara Railroad, the Zambia-Tanzania Railroad. Now, uh, Zambia is a landlocked country, Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe is to the south and from there South Africa. Zambia was trying to become independent of the uh, apartheid powers. So they wanted to export their copper and they wanted to, to do it through another African country. And they, they needed an outlet to the sea. So their adjoining country was Tanzania and Tanzania has a large port in Dar es Salaam. And so Zambia wanted to build a railroad to, to export their copper from Zambia to Dar es Salaam. And the funding for that came from China. Uh, it was, it was a, about a thousand mile, 1200 mile, 1800 kilometer railroad started in the 1960s and completed in 1975, all funded by China. And our speaker last week told when I reviewed this presentation with him, John Katzka, and he told me that he, when he was a diplomatic officer in Zambia, he actually rode the Tazara Railroad. The thing that astounds me is that if you're familiar with Chinese history, during the 1960s, China was in complete turmoil. The uh, a Great Leap Forward had just concluded in the early 60s, and the, the uh, agreed upon number of of deaths in the Great Leap Forward today is 45 million people. Some numbers go as high as 90 million, but I think the consensus among scholars is 45 million people perished in the Great Leap Forward in the early 60s. And then there was a cult cultural revolution in the late 60s and early 70s, where another 2 million people perished and China was in total chaos. Yet in spite of all this, they still managed to divert some of their funds to, to su support and pay for the development of this uh, railroad. And it was completed around 1975 and this is the president uh, Kwanda of Zambia and Nair of Tanzania uh, at the final uh, uh, completion of the railroad. So this is, a, this is a real milestone in African development. During this time, China was also involved in supporting some of the colonial war, anti-colonial wars that were going on in Africa. China's uh, evolving um, investment strategy uh, in, is, can be is summarized in this slide. With the death of Mao in 1976, there's the anarchy in China came to an end. It was just, no one really knew what to do going forward. It was, the country was in, in complete ruins from the Cultural Revolution. So the, the Deng Xiaoping came into power and it started a, what the Chinese referred to as a reform period. This is a period of internal development that lasted about till 1989. They were encouraging uh, uh, investment from, um, external external investment from, from the, to come there from the United States, from, from uh, Japan and from Europe. And this, this period of uh, reform lasted until the Tiananmen Square incident. And, and as a result of the Tiananmen Square incident, it's a number of their, their relation, China's relationship with foreign powers uh, greatly cooled off and were curtailed. And the foreign investment going into China was curtailed. So China was looking for new friends. So they re-energized their, their going out policy to um, develop relations in Africa. 
And this was started by Deng Xiaoping. It was called the Go Going Out Strategy. That's a direct translation from the Chinese. And uh, this, this started in the 90s, but continues to this day. The period of increasing investment in Africa, concerning enough that it that, that was they actually uh, this week the uh, United Nations, uh, uh, not the the uh, Biden administration for the leader of the United Nations was quizzed about this uh, what she was going to do about uh, China's investment in Africa because it's quite substantial as you'll see, and I don't know if it's a threat to the United States, but uh, we have certainly left a vacuum there for them to do that. China started an organization called the Forum of China-Africa Cooperation. And this was started in 2000. The first meeting was in Beijing. And the loan commitments from this forum to Africa grew from uh, $5 billion to $60 billion. The actual uh, lending in 2016 was, uh, was $30 billion. Um, let's see, I'm going to let somebody in here. The, uh, this picture on the right is, is Xi Jinping. This is, this is after 2012 when he came to power, but he is a great champion of this form of this uh, China-Africa cooperation. And you can see this is a summary of the loans that China has made to Africa between 2000 and 2016, peaking in 2016 in excess of $30 billion distributed around Africa. The, the, these are, the important thing to remember that these are loans, not grants. And there's a, this, the China government fully expects that this money is going to be repaid. All lending is official from government to government. The interest rates are near the private market. In other words, in other words there's no special deals on the interest that has to, is paid on the money. And during this time, the debt from African countries to China has grown from 1% of their gross domestic product to 15% in 2015. And you can see here, as of uh, this slide, in 2017, a total of $143 billion has been loaned from China to Africa with an expectation that these projects are going to get paid back. Uh, the biggest uh, source of destination is Angola. It's, it's probably because of their mineral resources, where there, where there are probably barter uh, agreements, but also to Ethiopia uh, is the second. Number two, Kenya is number three. We talked about this Tarzera, Tarzera Railroad. Uh, Sudan, Republic of Congo and Sudan. Those are the top five destinations of this Chinese money that's going into Africa. But it's really going all over Africa, as you can see from this, this chart. Um, question came up last week about mining and rare earths in, in Africa. So I made a point of looking into this before I made the, put this presentation together. I added this slide. The, um, Rare earths are not, not the primary source of, China, Africa is not the primary source of rare earth minerals. But this is a slide of Chinese uh, control mines around the world in 2005. Not particularly impressive, but look how it's grown in 2018. Look at all the investment all over the world and especially in Africa uh, by Chinese uh, uh, buying up or developing mining interests because China is such a large consumer of raw material to, to uh, uh, support their development. And they, they need these raw materials and that's why they're going around the world trying to, to develop them. And the trade, you can see the trade between China and Africa summarized in this, in this slide. And you can see that, that China is on the left-hand column is what China is importing. The trade is fairly balanced. In fact, China is buying more than they're selling. Uh, but the main thing they're buying from Africa is minerals. In turn, Africa is buying transportation products like railroads and machinery and electrical goods and textiles. Those are the main imports from China uh, to Africa. And finally, uh, uh, Africa, you may not know this, but China is the largest consumer of copper in the world. And uh, China, China interests control 28% of the copper production in Africa. I guess this is a lot, but these other companies are international. First Quantum is a Canadian company, as is Barrick. These are both Canadian mining companies and Glencore is an Anglo-Swiss company. So, so these are the other big players in African minerals. And I guess it, it shouldn't be a surprise that China's trying to, to uh, uh, lock down the supply of copper from Africa and elsewhere. Some huge projects for copper in Mongolia that my company was involved in, with, that China was developing in Mongolia. 
So that's just one, one example of how China's trying to corner the middle, mineral market. But I wouldn't say they've actually cornered it. Um, China's also been involved in peacekeeping in Africa. And, and this is a picture from, from, uh, from the Great Decisions book. But I, I looked up where they've been involved and you can see here, it's, it's pretty modest. They have, they have a presence in, in Sudan and, and in Congo and in, in Mali, but they, they, have, they have contributed uh, soldiers to the UN peacekeeping forces in those countries. The, one of the other big areas is African students going to China to study. This has grown from less than 2000 at the beginning of this FOCAC form to, to, to uh, in 2015, 50,000. I think it's more than that today. Training of students is really important. I, I was really saddened when our administration started pushing foreign students out of the United States because this is one of the best ways to develop relationships between countries. Uh, UWM used to have a huge amount, huge foreign presence, and I hope that will return. The students, when they're there, they, they develop relationships that last them a lifetime. They learn about our country, or, or in this case, learn about China. They, they, they learn about how China does things. They learn about China's technical standards, which are a little different than, for example, American technical standards, which is very important. It's when you're trying to sell your products. And they develop, develop a common way of thinking. So China has been really trying to develop their relation, their long-term relationship with Africa by educating a lot of their students. The other thing that China has been doing is it's developed, it has these Confucian, Confucius Institutes to promote Chinese culture. They're all over the world and they're all over Africa. And they stress Chinese culture and provide an opportunity to learn and study Chinese. There have been some Confucius Institutes in the United States as I understand that most of them were forced to close uh, during the last administration. Um, personally, I think it would be a great way to learn Chinese. It's not easy to learn. So infrastructure is Africa's top priority and this really fits nicely with China's capabilities. Africa's intracontinental trade is only 15% compared to 70% in Europe. So if someone wants to export uh, a product that's manufacturing a product in New Jersey and want us to export it to, uh, to say Denver, Colorado, they, if, they, if it was equivalent in China, you might have to ship it by ocean to Los Angeles and then take a train to Denver. The, that would be the analogous situation where it's presently in Africa because China doesn't have any internal infrastructure to allow intracontinental trade. And you know, if you compare this to Europe, 70% of Europe's trade is intercontinental between different countries within Europe, but there's very low in China. So this is real limit, uh, sorry, in Africa, this is a real limitation on African development. So Africa has huge needs for infrastructure and China's going out strategy has encouraged SOEs, that's the word for state owned enterprises. Those are, those are institu institutions that are owned by the Chinese government and their manufacturers and some of my competitors in China, many of them were state-owned enterprises. And they're not particularly efficient, but they're pretty massive. And they, they have one advantage, they don't really care about making money. So they can, they, they, their, their market pricing which sometimes doesn't reflect what's really their costs. But they've been challenged by China to go out and seek markets to apply their expertise. And they're quite good at building railroads, um, power plants, highways, bridges, that's, their, that's what they're good at is infrastructure. The FOCAC loans, Forum and China Africa Cooperation Loans, require that the, that, that the recipient, the guy who takes, the country that takes the loans, uses Chinese contractors and Chinese products. And this may seem unfair if you're hearing this for the first time, but in early part of my career, we were involved a lot in export business from the United States using AID funding, American International Development Funding, and those loans to say Pakistan or Bangladesh had the same requirement that they use our products and our services. So this is kind of natural the way this way this thing happens around the world. Um, but this, this had a significant in fact, impact on my business that was Cooper Power Systems business in China because suddenly we can access markets, particularly in Africa, that we never accessed before because we we're accessing them through Chinese contractors, provided we were making the products in China. The Kenya Stage uh, Standard Gauge Railroad is an allegorical story 
for, for what's going on with China loans to Africa. We talked previously about the Tazara Railroad, which, was, which is here from Zambia through Tanzania to the coast. The, the Kenya Standard Grades Railroad was a three-part project to build railroad connection from through Kenya to Uganda and all the way to South Sudan. And the, the project had three stages. First went to Nairobi, the capital of Kenya. And then and it, it, the Africa, after, Africa um, coastal area is really kind of unlivable. Most of the population is in, in, in ter, interior where the higher elevation, a little bit better climate. So, so it was important to be able to export their goods to the coast so they needed this railroad. But um, the first section of the railroad was completed with Chinese money in 2017. The $3.8 billion investment, second section, which is just a small stretch from Nairobi to this town of Naivasha, was uh, completed in 2019 with one and a half billion dollars investment. This is all funded by the Chinese Exim Bank. So Exim means export import bank. There's also, you know, there's an American Exim Bank also. But in 2019, China refused to fund the third section of the Uganda Railroad. The costs were higher than other projects perhaps inflated by corruption. The railroad was not profitable and Kenya debt had become a big worry. The president of Kenya went to China around this time with, uh, asking for loans to, to complete the third section and he was turned down, which is a pretty abrupt change in what the trend in what China's policy has been. Debt is the big concern in Africa. 22% of African debt is to China. Projects must be implemented by Chinese contractors. The long-term loans are opaque and at risk of corruption. And the economic effects of COVID-19 have forced many African countries to renegotiate the debt. And this has led to a lot of theories about the China debt trap, which might be, uh, Chinese people might say it's a Western conspiracy theory, but here's what it's based on. Uh, in the country of Sri Lanka, it's a small island nation off the coast of, southern coast of India. There's a big civil war, lasts almost 20 years between the uh, Sinhalese population and the majority and the Tamil minority. And, and eventually Chinese military intervened in the early 2000s and helped the uh, Sinhalese population uh, win the war over the minority Tamils. And then as a result of this, China gained a lot of influence in Sri Lanka. And Sri Lanka is a very historic, uh, very important strategic port. Historically, it was a British coaling station, key route on their, their routes between Suez and China and India. So this port is very important. So China uh, loaned money to the Sri Lankan government, the government that was really indebted to China for helping them uh, win the civil war. And, and then when then they, they modernized this very important port, and then the, um, when the Sri Lankan couldn't, government couldn't pay for the port, they defaulted on the loan. So people are accusing China of having creating these debt traps. They loan the country a lot of money. They can't pay the money back. They have to forfeit the asset as part of the collateral and the debt. And this, in fact, happened in Zambia, where, where China took over a power st uh, station in Zambia because the Zambian uh, government defaulted on the debt there. So the Africans want the development. The money is uh, easy to get, but it comes with strings attached. And, and, and it's in the, the Financial Times and other news organizations re refer to this as a China debt trap. But it's also a trap for China. I know a lot of my friends in China are very skeptical about all this money being loaned out to Africa. They quietly don't approve. Uh, and there's, it's reached the highest levels in Beijing that people are afraid this money isn't going to be paid back. So China's, this is a graph of China's historical lending. The dark blue is, is uh, China's lending. The light blue is, is the World Bank lending at the same period of time. And you can see 2016 was indeed the, the peak year for China's lending. But suddenly in 2018 and 19, it has dropped down quite a bit. This is the most recent data I have. But the lending stopped because China people were afraid that they weren't going to get paid back. And my company was involved in a major, major power project as a subcontractor to a Chinese state-owned enterprise in Brazil. And all our, all our uh, contracts were either written in US dollars or in Chinese renminbi, the Chinese currency. But the Chinese contracts were, they were getting paid in Brazilian currency. In the middle of the project, the Brazilian real 
uh, went was reduced by 70% in value. So, but but uh, this really made the project a huge loss for China. But uh, we thought they were going to come back and try to force us to renegotiate the price, but they didn't blink an eye and they paid us the original price. They didn't ask for any kind of discount. And they took a huge loss in this project. And I think that, and this is just one example, the ones in Brazil. So I think they're reconsidering what they're doing as far as how generous they want to be with these loans. The other area of China and Africa is the technology and consumer development. The loans give Chinese companies a huge advantage. You've heard probably a lot about Huawei. The, the previous administration was trying to pressure uh, various governments around the world not to use Huawei. Huawei is a tele, uh, 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 telecommunications provider, but uh, they have already built 70% of Africa's uh, mobile phone network. It's difficult for countries to resist pressure to divest in the Huawei. They're so integrated into, into the whole telecommunication system in Africa. Um, the the uh, Chinese companies have a big role in uh, music streaming in Africa and uh, Chinese facial recognition uh, technology, of course, is appealing to, perhaps appealing to some African uh, despotic leaders who wanna manage their, the dissonance in their population. So Huawei is there, and this is another where, place where uh, Africa is uh, pretty much pretty close to China. The, um, China has a vision of Africa 2063. So where did 2063 come from? Well, in 1963, the African Union was started. And after 50 years in 2013, they created a vision for what Africa should be in 2063. And, uh, and this was uh, 50 years after the formation of the African Union. So Envision is a 50 year development plan and they even envision a single economic zone like the uh, Euro Eurozone. The, uh, the plan envisions uh, digital infrastructure and, uh, uh, and cultural preservation. Well, you can't have any kind of development without talking about infrastructure and the countries that that's number one in the world in, in developing infrastructure is China because they just went through a massive infrastructure development in their own country. China's infrastructure, they're just a natural part, a partner for Agenda 63. And one of the showcase projects is um, this port park city development model. And this is done in Ethiopia where the uh, manufacturing areas developed around the capital of Ethiopia they developed a railroad to take people and goods to the coast in Djibouti at the port uh, uh, of Djibouti. And, and, uh, so they, and then they built the port. So it was Port Park City. So it became um, uh, a complete turnkey project really from, from, from uh, the source in Addis Ababa to the port in Djibouti and all the manufacturing to go in between. This is a, a, a ceremony of Chinese people uh, and, and, and people in, in Djibouti, um, uh, you know, ceremony opening the port. So, so this is one of the key projects and it's just a great uh, example of what can, can happen with Chinese development mo uh, model money. And of course, every African country wants to get in on it. There's effects though of US-China trade tensions in Africa and as this came up in the congressional hearings with our, our new UN representative, new representative to the UN. China is very focused on bilateral relations with individual countries. So they're using this debt diplomacy to get things done that they wanna get done. Uh, African countries have supported China and the United Nations and other multicultural agencies. For example, they've all pushed Taiwan out of the United Nations they are electing uh, Chinese officials to, to the key UN agencies. And if anybody criticizes China and Xinjiang, the African countries, even though many of them are Muslim countries, do not criticize China's conduct in Xinjiang. So uh, again, this is what China wants back from in their diplomacy. African countries feel identify a lot with China. They feel that they've been excluded from the UN Security Council, G7, G20, Bretton Woods, World Health Organization. So their 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 sympathies are with China. Energy is the other big area. China is a is is a huge energy uh, producer, and they produce all the equipment to to make the to convert the energy. They're the largest coal fired ge power generator in the world. China is the largest importer of foreign oil in the world, and China is the largest implementer of renewable energy in the world. 
China's state-owned enterprises, this is that word again, uh, SOEs are under pressure to export their capabilities and uh, China, they're built, and with these SOEs, they're building both renewable and conventional energy projects in Africa. The individual countries have, have the right to choose. They can choose a renewable or conventional energy, whatever they want to do. Now, as I said, this has affected my business. When I was in China, I'm retired now, but uh, this, is, this business was developed while I was in China. And this is, this is a, we have a joint venture in Shanghai that's, uh, we own 60% of it. And uh, this is Eaton Cooper Power Systems. And uh, the Chinese partner, Shanghai Electric, owns the other 40%. And we have been, because we're a Chinese company, also we have an international brand name, we've been able to export uh, product made in China with US technology to um, these countries in Africa. And this is a, a big project in, in, uh, in Ethiopia. This is a big transmission project. This is completed while I was in China in 2012. Another one is in uh, Mozambique. These are series compensation, high, high voltage transmission projects that was completed in 2015 before I left China. And after I left this, another one my guys did in, in South Africa. It was very hungry for power. These are all involved in high efficiency, high, highly efficient energy transmission. Uh, African countries are, the population is starting to push back. They're becoming more activist in environmentalism. And there's growing resistance to use of coal-powered electricity in Africa. And the, uh, in Kenya, the NGOs blocked a Chinese coal fire plant in 2018. This picture was from the briefing, the Great Decisions briefing book. Uh, Zimbabwe and South Africa continue to build coal fire plants. Uh, South Africa used to be the gold-plated power system, not only of Africa, but of the world. And uh, in recent years, unfortunately, that's, they've fallen apart and there's huge power shortages in Africa. And they're going to build whatever they can get the cheapest and the fastest because they, the population is very unhappy with the, the collapse of their electrical system. A lot's been spoken about the Belt and Road. Most of these loans are, are under an initiative in China called the Belt and Road Initiative. When this first appeared, when we first, Xi Jinping came to power in 2012, and that's when we first started hearing about Belt and Road. And we didn't, we didn't really know what he was talking about, that they were gonna build, China just completed the construction of a high-speed uh, railroad net, network all over the, the country. And we thought that Belt and Road was an extension of the high, high speed rail line all the way across the old Silk Road into uh, Europe. But then we started hearing that China was improved, buying up port facilities and improving them like the one I talked about in Sri Lanka. It's also a lot of development in Somalia uh, of a port right next to the American basin in Somalia. Then we heard they're investing in Piraeus in Greece and, and a port in Italy, and even a port in uh, Northern Europe. So this became, uh, this, we, then, and along with this came all kinds of development loans and this became a blanket uh, description for Xi Jinping's uh, uh, expression of the going out strategy of, uh, and it's really a global project projection of power and influence. There's a commitment now of 1 trillion US dollars investments outside of China for the Belt and Road. So it's a strange name in Chinese, it's e Dai e Lu, one belt, one road, but that's become uh, BRI in English. The, uh, the Belt and Road stresses connectivities. This is a natural play for Africa. Uh, infrastructure, free trade, financial integration, policy coordination, people to people exchanges. Uh, most African countries have signed on to the BRI. You actually have to sign on to it. Um, and one of the conditions of signing on to it is you have to sever your relationships with Taiwan. Only one African country has not done that. I think it's Botswana. Everybody else, no, I'm sorry, it's Lesotho. This is the only one that has not signed on to the BRI. So, um, the, um, it's a powerful economic diplomacy. And this is why people in the United States, why, why this came up in the congressional hearings in the last week, because there's a, cons a real concern about uh, what this might mean in the future. So the question is, and this is what I hope we can discuss when we get to the end, and I'm coming near the end, is how should the United States respond? And the, the Great Decisions book makes five suggestions in the areas of education, debt, services, media diplomacy, and diaspora outreach and technology. The first area is one we talked about earlier is, is educating African students. 
Uh, in 2017, uh, we educated 46,000 students. That, that grew 30% from 2011. But in the same period in 2017, China educated, had 74,000 African students studying there. And that had grown by 258%. I think, as I understand, it's grown a lot more since then. But, but unfortunately, we've been pushing students out uh, of the United States during the, during the, uh, during the um, uh, last administration. I hope we can reverse that trend going forward. Debt's the second area where we can do something. And Africa is suffer suffering from unsustainable debt levels. The largest debt is with China. Uh, there's opaque Chinese lending practices exacerbate the problem. Um, and, and Great Decisions is advocating that the United States should lead efforts to have China conform to global norms of transparency. And, all, and my comments at the end, easier said than done. But anyway, it's a noble idea. Services is an area where the United States is very strong. We have a relative comparative advantage in this area. We have uh, US legal firms. We have very internationally uh, top-notch consultants. We have research institutes. And we can aid African civil societies in driving more transparency and lending, which would help a lot. Then there's media, diplomacy, and diaspora outreach. American media is massively popular in Africa, can be a vehicle for public diplomacy. The USA has a, a large population from African countries. One of our neighbors where I live is from, they're, from, they're both from Mali. She's a PhD student at UWM and he's a statistician at the uh, medical college. So highly educated and very refined people. Um, these relationships have been better between African expats living, expatriates living in the United States and African expatriates living in China. And one example that's kind of sadly discussed is in the city of Guangzhou. This is near Hong Kong. During the coronavirus, the Chinese uh, local population wouldn't provide any service for, for, for uh, Africans living in the city of Guangzhou. They forced them to leave their housing. And uh, there was you know, some pretty tense moments, apparently, that it made the international press. And I can tell you, you know, I, the United States, we're certainly all aware of the difficult uh, problems the United States has in uh, race relations, but I can tell you that the Chinese have their own problems and they have their own prejudices, which may be more severe than those in, that exist in the United States. So they have their own challenges. And then there's technology. Uh, our leadership in technology is widely uh, recognized. But China is the major internet and mobile phone provider in, in Africa. I don't think we're gonna change that. The USA should encourage our tech sector to increase cooperation with China. This is another recommendation from the Great Decisions uh, article. And we, and we should foster closer relationships uh, that will benefit both the United States and African partners. For example, encouraging more joint ventures uh, with African countries. Um, so China technology, China is a major internet and mobile phone provider. We're not gonna, we're, we're not gonna change that. And, uh, and we should recognize that Africans have uh, misgivings about Chinese technology also, but, but it, it's so, it, you know, so easy to get. And it's much easier to do business with China than to do business with the United States. And finally, this is a slide that I, that I took down from, uh, that I found showing African perceptions of China. And you can see green is greater than 80% of the people are positive. Light green is greater than 70%. And you can see, if you look at all the major African countries, their, their uh, view of China is quite positive. So we have our work to do to make it equally positive of America. And that's it for my presentation. I have, I reproduced the great decisions questions. Why don't I show you the questions and I'll take it off the screen share. So the book proposed, proposed um, a total of, uh, I think five or six questions. And the first question was, how has Africa's historical relationship with Europe shaped its relationship with China? Why, and that's a reference to colonialism. Why have US efforts uh, to stop African cooperation with China been unsuccessful? And what are the hallmarks of the Chinese models that relates to Africa? Uh, how do you think that, Af that the debt will reshape the China-Africa relationship? And what are the pros and cons of African 
countries collaborating with Chinese technology companies. And finally, what role has infrastructure played in China-Africa relationship? So that's the end of my talk, my screen. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I think John Katzka has joined us. Maybe he can tell us about the Tazara Railroad. So can everybody see everybody else? I took my, I unshared my screen for a moment. Well, sorry to, to uh, come in late on this, Rick. Uh, I was actually, my son-in-law has a, uh, had a gala. He's the executive director of the, uh, the Institute of Current World Affairs that is celebrating its 96th year in operation. And so uh, I had a, do the familial thing as opposed to the great decisions thing. Uh, I was in Zambia from 1981 to 1984. And the, 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 the Zambians and the Nigerians, I mean, and the Tanzanians uh, appealed to the United States, to the World Bank, uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the Soviet Union to build a railway between Zambia and, and Dar es Salaam to improve uh, transportation. And transportation is an enormously difficult thing in Africa. It divides up along uh, colonial lines and traveling by air when I was in that part, you had to go to Europe to go to another part of Africa because they didn't have the connections. Well, the Tazara was built across the Rift Valley uh, a, uh, a a natural wonder, but a uh, but an engineering nightmare, and the Chinese agreed to take it on, and uh, the uh, they built it. I got on a uh, we uh, uh, a, the economic officer and I decided to take a train ride to Dar es Salaam, and uh, the the you had to take everything you needed. And of course, coming from Milwaukee, I, there had to be enough beer for a long train ride. So we had one, one uh, we had two coolers. One was with beer that was available immediately. Another one was frozen. And we were very popular on that train trip. I was actually training for a marathon at the time. And so I'd get, every time we stopped, I'd get out and run for 10, 10 minutes uh, alongside. And it didn't matter if I was building up a good, good healthy sweat because the, uh, the odor in the compartment was, uh, I was embracing it rather than uh, repelling it. Uh, but the train down through, the trip down through the Rift Valley was, uh, was at night. And I think I'm, I'm grateful for that because it's supposed to be a bit harrowing. The Chinese uh, in, in Zambia have right now, it, and you may have mentioned this, Rick, it, have a, a very unhappy relationship with the Zambian government. They've taken over uh, one entity there. And it, this is one of the cases that where the Chinese, not only do they bring their own workers, not only do they, they this is the, it's almost a, a, a repeat of what the Japanese did in Southeast Asia when I was there in the, in the early 70s. Uh, the, all, everything, they, when, the Chinese, when the Japanese would come, they would go to a Japanese tour company, stay in a Japanese hotel. And the first things that they went to see were Japanese related businesses. Uh, the Chinese are doing much the same way in terms of, the, of their business interests. But that's a long story about uh, a, a very interesting trade ride. Thanks, John. We did talk about the uh, debt trap, the China debt trap. We did talk about the difficulties of China, of Africa, intercontinental uh, trade and transportation. So does anybody want to, have, should we talk about some of these subjects? Please, let's make it have a discussion. Well, let me throw one out right away. Uh, China has already taken over some of the enterprises that they developed, uh, but that's only a uh, that's only the start of this process. There are loans out to an awful lot of people, and I, who are, are unlikely able to be able to repay them. 
What do you see as the way in which the Chinese are going to deal with this? You're, you're asking the group, I hope. <laughs> I'm asking the expert. Well, I think the Chinese, and we had a slide about the trend in, in, uh, in loans, the China, China external loans. And, and we, we pointed out that 2016 was a peak year. And in 2018 and 19, the loans have drastically dropped out. So I think the Chinese are reconsidering. What the, my opinion is that they're reconsidering what they're doing. But uh, I think they've been on a real roll here. And uh, this is Xi Jinping's uh, baby. And it's very hard to say no to Xi Jinping. So I think they're, they're going to have a lot of uh, low performing loans. And that's going to just going to take them a while to work their way through that. Yeah. That's my opinion. I know, I know McKnight has a question. He's always got a good question. And he's not even moving. <laughs> he's got a screen muted. Don't be shy. Anybody can jump in and ask yeah. a question. I have a question. It's related to the first point you had on the uh, uh, student body, uh, the, the uh, American students or the African students being sent to the US. But you, uh, and there is a disparity, many more uh, African students were going to China than the US. But what is the balance of the Western influence in, uh, on uh, African students? Uh, I would presume that most of the Francophone, uh, a lot of the Francophone kids go to France and a lot of uh, Nigerians may go to the UK for college. Well, as I mentioned, my neighbors are from Mali. That's a Francophone country and they are French speaking, but they're yeah. here at UWM. Yeah, but a lot of them, uh, I lived in West Africa back a long time ago in the 60s. Okay. And most of the, uh, most of the African students went to France from, uh, I was in Guinea and, and uh, uh, well, Guinea most of the time. They all went to France for training. Right. People from Nigeria went to the UK. And I just wonder if that trend still continues. Well, I'll go back here to the slide. Let me see, I can share it. Let me just see if I can find it first. Because while you're looking for that slide, let me give you an, an example. We, and it goes to the, your almost your last slide where you're we talking about uh, the impression of of Africans about China, and and there's a parallel here between what went on in the developing world and the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union brought enormous numbers of people to the in. Uh, students uh, that were, you talked about the racism that was going on. Well, the Soviet Union was, was more racist than anything I have seen in the United States in terms of how they treated the black or people of color in the, in, 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 uh, in, 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 in the major cities. Uh, and, and actually that's the only place these people went and they were there to study a variety of things. In fact, my cardiologist had got one of his degrees in the Soviet Union. And whenever we get together, we talk in, in Russian. Uh, well, that's an aside. Uh, but th that, those are the sorts of things that where culture plays an enormous role and where, where when one, one culture feels much more arrogant about other cultures, there are issues that come up that have long-term effects that will undermine the, 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 the role, the impact, the, the contribution that these major countries are making to, uh, to a continent like Africa. I have one other question about China, and that is on, do they have an immigration policy? Can a foreigner become a Chinese citizen? No, only extremely unusual conditions. No. I ask that because I know quite a few African students in the 60s and 70s came to the States to uh, study and never went home. And so did a lot of Chinese students. Yeah. <laughs> so a whole lot. I have this slide, if you want, I can try to share it, of the, the student slide, see if I, 
you know, it's, uh, can you see that screen? Yeah, I see it. Yeah, it's, you know, if you, you know, by far Europe is educating more, and this is 2017, than China or the United States, but the, but the trend is flat. I mean, it, you know, yeah. I think it's a natural trend to England and to France because they were the former colonial powers and right. the various uh, commercial arrangements they have between the two countries. How much do you think cost is a factor in that? I think it's a lot. I think these people are probably mostly coming on scholarships. Yeah. So I don't know, but I would speculate. Well, in, in, in the United States, the, the, the availability of scholarships have, have waned significantly because of the lack of government support for many of these public institutions. This is why the, uh, like the UWM loves Chinese students because they pay full, full freight and they're, they're hurting when, they, when, they, when the Chinese students are being forced out, that's hurting, <coughs> hurting, uh, the university's finances. I mean, that's another element here. A few, not that many years ago, for, uh, foreign uh, students in the United States was a major foreign policy, foreign uh, currency earner for the United States. Yes, that's part of our goods and services that we're exporting, our services that we're exporting. That's one of our strengths. And we should, we're, we just tied one arm behind our back in the last four years. I wonder if many of those students actually came from Africa though. I can see them coming from Latin America, for example. Well, the biggest students by far, by, by way by far, is we're from China in the, all the US universities. I have some, some statistics and I didn't put that in here today. Rick, there's a question in chat. Yes. Um, Carol is asking about um, Russia's desire for a deep water port in Africa and how does that work with China? and U.S. relations? Well, we got the expert here, so I'm going to turn that over to China. <laughs> uh, China and Russia uh, are being forced to become closer than they would like to be. And we and the Europeans are, are fostering that new relationship. Uh, China doesn't ask the Russians about, sanction, about their human rights and, and Russians don't ask the Chinese about human rights and democracy promotion. Um, and therefore, when they get into areas where they're, they're competing, uh, they're gonna be very careful at this point in time. But eventually th that, that relationship, depending upon how we behave going forward in this whole thing, uh, I think the Chinese-Russian relationship will Will uh, will not foster. It will not get better. Uh, I have a question. I only I was listening to William Burns uh, testify, and I only got a uh, he, uh, being considered or been recommended to be the. Um, new chief of the CIA, and he, uh, you know, I heard a small amount of a very long bit of testimony, but it was, he was uh, very uh, critical of China and saw uh, a number of connections that uh, I think, um, uh, Rick, you would um, think we should be fostering. And uh, you, you spoke of the last four years and certainly was a change. Uh, I was surprised that Burns was as negative as he was about uh, university sharing and so on. Uh, as I say, this uh, my knowledge is very fragmented on that. Uh, either one of you, I'm assuming he will be uh, the next head of the CIA. Are you saying he's negative about having Chinese students studying here because we will lose technology will leak back to China? Is that what you're saying? Yes, he's oh. yes that and the uh, uh, the the Confucian uh, organizations at the universities are are uh, should be gotten rid of because they are um, just ways to infiltrate and. Um, well, I think there's a lot of anti-China hysteria in the country right now. I mean, certainly all those things are true, 
but it's all but it's also true if you look at all the look at the corona vaccine look how many chinese names are associated with the research or look at apple and uh, silicon uh, valley companies look how many chinese researchers are there contributing to our development so it's it it goes both ways i think a huge amount of talent has come here to 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 study and has applied their skills to make our, our, our us a better place i mean there, yes there's risk of stuff leaking back being compromised and that's something perhaps we have to manage but I, I i would say that in the congress today and the general mood of the country is uh, at least suspicious of chinese intentions and and that is that spills over into uh especially uh citizens of china who come to study in the united states and especially since they are primarily going into stem related fields uh and the the flow of uh of valuable information going back because our our academic world is 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 not is is looking at this much more in your kumbaya kind of attitude then you know we'll all work together on these big problems and they're being much more narrowly focused is is, is how i see the Congress looking at it, and I suspect the presidency as well. Yeah, I think it's politically useful. You know, that's the political mood today. But I think there's a risk in that. I mean, just for example, I, I invited a Chinese friend to come tonight. She couldn't make it, but I met her at UWM. She's a postdoc student here. Everybody in her, she's now Stevens in New Jersey. Everybody in uh, the university is, and the, they're studying my business is my expertise is in power systems, and they're all getting postdocs and PhDs in power systems and every one of them is Chinese. The people involved, I, went, I attended a conference on the grid failure in Texas. At least half the engineers were Chinese immigrants that were leading the conference. So, so if we don't figure out how to get more Native Americans, let's call it, uh, American born citizens entering STEM programs, uh, our, our STEM programs driven by immigrants. And I think it's a mistake to shut that talent down. I think it's a huge mistake. Well, one of the things that that we came away with last week when we talked about supply chains is when you begin to look at our Chinese connection, there are alternatives. And so if you if you want to make sure that if you're going to have information leak, it's going to places that are 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 more attuned to our way of life. Uh, and in the supply chains, we can move into, uh, we can fo focus more on Taiwan, we can focus more on Southeast Asia. Uh, in terms of education, there are lots of other places and we need to make available to them. We're not going to be worried about uh, technology transfer to Africa in the same way that we're going to worry about it in terms of China. Just how long do you think that Taiwan is going to continue to exist as an independent state? Well, that's a good question. It's going to be one of the challenges in the next four years for sure. Yeah. Well, and this is why this is, and I would ex suspect that that uh, the major capitalists on Taiwan are looking as they did in South Africa, uh, when South Africa, the, the uh, the the white majority rule i was in zambia as i mentioned earlier uh when the white majority rule was coming to an end uh they moved their their holdings and their and their investments to the west indies yeah. uh taiwan in fact the the the, the mount pleasant project is uh, a case of where a taiwanese business is is looking to uh offshore to the United States and to Wisconsin. Well, the largest semiconductor supplier to the United States is a company called TSMC. I forget the exact meaning of the acronym, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, maybe. They are head of Intel and they're the largest supplier of semiconductors in the world. The Chinese you know, would love to, to have a better relationship with that company. But what I'm reading is the current leader of Taiwan, Tsai Ing-wen, it's a woman, Tsai Ing-wen is her name. 
that she's backing, cooling a little bit of her separatist rhetoric. She doesn't want to push things too far. Yeah, I, I saw that as well. Yeah, I think I think you're going to see uh, Taiwan will do the dance as full China. Be lots of noise, but I'm not sure how much action. They should reach accommodation. Well, I think hopefully nobody will make a mistake. Well, see, the trouble is that they both think of themselves as being China. Well, actually, not China. And Taiwan today is reinventing a new history, the non-Chinese history. In fact, you're right; they're both from China, but they're inventing a new history as part of their independence move. I have friends in Taiwan who so say, "I can't believe how all the books are being rewritten." Uh, it's been done before. Yeah. There's a question in chat from Annette. Do you know if the Muslim students from Africa and China are facing any issues um, or persecution? She's thinking of how the Uyghurs are being treated in China. Well, the Uyghurs, you know, they're a unique Turkic group in, in, the, uh, in the Western part of China. There are other Muslims and groups in China besides the Uyghurs. There, there, there are several other large Muslim groups that are in China. The Kazakhs are one and other people are away people. So, the, but the Uyghurs have been pushing for independence, and that's where the persecution is coming from. As far as African students in China go, um, I guess undoubtedly a lot of them are Muslims, but uh, I'm not aware of anything particularly happening to them. I think it's been more based on racial prejudice. Yes, it's color that's a driver. Yeah. Um, I I just wanted to mention that um, there was a film in the Milwaukee Film Festival this last summer. Um, it was it's called Coded Bias, and it's about artificial intelligence and um, um, you Huawei uh, using their methods, which was mentioned also in this in the article on China and Africa. Um, I. Um, and I'm thinking about um, places in Africa where they uh, there's a strong authoritarian uh, rule, and wondering what percentage or um, you know how much we have to be careful of um, using our our communication system to spy on each other or, you know, to use it against people. Just worried about that. Well, I guess we're using a lot of facial recognition technology now, trying to figure out who was, uh, who are the bad guys in the Capitol riot. Yeah. Well, and you, I think you correctly pointed out that uh, we all do it. Uh, when we, we look at the, the fact that the, the Russians are doing certain things, uh, you should know that we do it as well. Maybe not to the same in the same way and not to the same degree, but nations have a way in which to choose the weapons that are most convenient and most, uh, most expeditious for them. And uh, we tend to move on in a different, uh, different wavelength. One thought when we talk about this uh, authoritarian governments and, and there is no doubt that there has been a rise. I think one of the ways in which you need to look at it is, is if, if you go back to the end of the Cold War and during the Cold War, we, we anointed a number of authoritarian governments um, as, as as our friends and our allies and ignored the fact that they were basically authoritarian underneath. And we, we, we saluted their elections and we didn't, we ignored some of the things that happened on the, on the sidelines. Well, when the Cold War went away, all of a sudden that fig leaf wasn't there anymore. And because human rights is such an important uh, foreign policy goal of the United States, uh, we began to focus on that. And we found that we were having increasing differences with people who we wanted to have good relations with because they were important to us in our foreign policy interests in particular parts of the world. 
and we're still we're still wrestling with that. Uh, Robert Kagan, who's at the Brookings Institute in Washington, said that the natural order of things is authoritarian. It is democracy which has to fight the uphill battle in order to be able to, to generate connections. Many people in many countries around the world only are concerned about whether or not they're gonna make it to the next day, whether or not they're going to be able to do the basic things in life, whether or not this is, uh, whether they have free speech or, or, or not is not one of the highest priorities in their lives. There are always people within societies and it's, it's the question becomes to what level, to what degree does this number of people grow before you can have to see a change in the culture, the dynamics of a particular country. But this is the Rokamora hour. I'm just a lowly engineer, John. <laughs> no one has ever accused me of being a diplomatic. In fact, several of my colleagues are on the call today. <laughs> they will assure you of that. <laughs> well, telling it straight is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just when you tell it straight. <laughs> I have a question about uh yeah my question would be uh as far as the debt load that they're putting on the ports and so forth do you, do you believe that that is intentional so that they overload them and the strategy being once they're overloaded we can control it be, uh because that's our avenue for taking control they load them up with debt i don't believe that but I know that's a conspiracy theory that's circulating. It's in the financial press. I showed you the headline, the debt trap referring to the port in Sri Lanka and the uh, utility in uh, Zambia. But I think it's uh, maybe a reality. Um, the, in the case of Malaysia, there are some huge loans that were negotiated and the, uh, the government that did that, they were accused of um, you know, a lot of corruption in the loans. And so the new Kickback. government- Kickbacks. Yeah, kickbacks. So the new government canceled all, canceled the projects and renegotiated them. Uh, Rick, it's, a, it's a problem for Africa. There, there is, it's definitely a problem for Africa. And that's why people are appealing for more transparency. Rick, do you think that there are two goals in, 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 in the primary goal that China has in many of these things is access to, re, to resources or strategic uh, strategic spots in terms of that flow of, of their necess of the needed goods that flow in. Right. And so that right. the secondary factor is whether or not the loans are gonna pay off. They're, they're focused more on the strategic dimension of this rather than is this a good deal or not? Yeah, I think it was a grand, you know, as I said, as I said, when this started, we, um, we, we, uh, you know, we, we didn't, um, when Belt and Road came around, we didn't really understand the, um, I'm just going to try to find it, try to find my Belt and Road slide. Okay. Can, they, can everybody see my screen or am I unshared? You're on, you're, you're just you. You got to bring it forward. All right, got to share my screen again. All right, here's the Belt and, here's the belt and Road slide. When, you know, I was in China when this was all going on and we, you know, I was hearing about it in meetings and I was re you know, reading the Western finance, I mean, the fin I could get the Financial Times delivered to my house every day in China. So I was reading it and um, trying to understand it and it didn't make a lot of sense to us what they were trying to do. They're spending a lot of money, but on the other hand, like countries like Greece, are just delighted to have their port modernized with Chinese money. And with that comes Chinese influence. 
So I think you know, China's, China's reaching out to the world, they're probably overdoing it. And at some point they're probably gonna pull back and maybe they're doing that right now. Aren't they also morphing into other ways in which they connect, for example, the digital Silk Road? Certainly, certainly, yes. But, you know, America, you know, are they really just trying to balance, trying to assert themselves as their own power their, for their own trading benefits? And America certainly has, uh, you know, we certainly have our place in the world. So it's, we're being, we're being pushed back. It's up to us what we're going to do about it. It's aggressive diplomacy. And I don't think it's worked in all countries, but it certainly worked had more success in Europe than elsewhere. China is, is more successful in Europe. I say, do you think they're more successful in Europe? No, I don't. No, I don't think so either. Now where where would you say they are successful? I think I think Africa has been their big success, and they've had success in Latin America. The last year's subject of great decisions, as you know, is Latin, China and Latin America. Okay, so. there is another question in chat. Um, there's some. Per one of your slides, there are some countries in Africa that don't view China favorably. Yes. How much influence do they have on the continent and could they sway other pro-China? Hold on, I gotta read the rest of this. Um, cut off. And could they sway other pro-China countries, I think is what the rest of it is. Could they influence the pro-China mm -hmm. countries? Well, here's the slide. Just go back to that slide for a second. And, uh, you know, if you look at the slide, the countries that are polled, all of them have at least a 50% favorability rating uh, attitude towards China. So, you know, the, the China comes with no strings attached. They're bringing money, money jobs, and better things to, to, to Africa. So they have, they have a positive viewpoint. I mean, we, you know, our, we have a president who's making derogatory remarks, or we had a president making incredibly coarse remarks about Africa. But you have Zambia there. It's that little. Right, that's right. I, what's that right there. here? No, that one up. That's that's Zimbabwe. That, that's Zambia. Okay. Uh, as, at, at 71 to 90 or 90%. And they're, they're going through a disconnection relationship with China. Because of the uh, confiscation of their power. Yes. Yeah, the countries always have the choice of defaulting on their loans. I mean, that's the trouble with debt. You know, if you, you, then what it's trying to have, they build a power plant in Zambia, Zambia nationalizes the asset and defaults it. So, I mean, how much leverage does China have? They certainly have some leverage. They can retaliate, but it's, it's, it's I don't think any, any lender wants, their, wants the person receiving the money to default. So I don't I don't see it as a conspiracy theory. I think they're rethinking their their programs personally. Okay. And my my co my colleagues in in China, some you know that uh, we we work with are very negative about the loans that China's making to Africa. Well, because they're micro players instead of macro players. Right. Well, they're they're, they're all wondering why. You know, it's the same argument we have in this country. Why are we giving foreign aid when we have so many problems at home? So, so, John, I think we, I think that's a good question we can ask you. Why why do we give foreign aid? Why does the United States do it? Well, if 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 you believe that you have benefited from the global globalization, and that's going to be a topic that you're going to address at the very end, isn't that right? Okay. Uh, then, then there are reasons why we want to make sure that. And we created the rules for this globalization after World War II. Uh, we more than anyone else, because the rest of Europe at this particular time was so devastated by World War II, we were the only ones, and it was mostly created by the United States. Well, one of the countries that was not did not participate in any of that was China. Actually, the Soviet Union really didn't participate in that either. So therefore, Russia didn't participate. And so when we make the rules, they favor the way in which we do things. There's a number of countries in the world, 
the non-aligned movement during the Cold War was based on the fact that these countries, largely in Africa and Asia uh, and Latin America, were not beneficiaries of this process. So foreign aid for us is to preserve a set of relationships. I have contended for a long time that, that our major goal after World War II was international stability that creating predictable relationships with countries around the world would allow us to foster business, to, to grow our businesses, to our the countries to grow themselves. Uh, the question then becomes who gets the benefits from those things. And we're finding that even in the United States, there is a good percentage of the population that is unhappy with the way in which this has worked out. So some of the things I'm reading now is that we're gonna look at what is globalization and that I'm gonna leave that for the last week of your program. And I'm enjoying the ride, thank you. I have a question about uh, ancient African history or not that ancient. Whatever happened to the OAU? I don't know, John, do you know? Yes, it's still in existence, but th there, is, there is no connections. Uh, the, 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 the connections that exist in Africa are to the colonial powers that were once there. Uh, South Africa has attempted to in Southern Africa. And if you looked on the, on, at, at one of the major focuses of those of countries that China is investing in, it isn't to Southern Africa. And Southern Africa has more raw materials than the rest of Africa, as, as I remember it. Uh, Nigeria having the, 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 the uh, fossil fuels. Well, Congo would be up there too. Who was? Congo. Congo, yeah, but Congo, yes, very close. Well, Congo is right, the, 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 the resources in Congo are right next to Zambia, which is right. Southern Africa. In fact, it was right, they, they were, I, I went up to uh, the, the Copper Belt, as it was called, uh, any number of times, run, run by Brit expats. Uh, and right across the river there was, was the Congo and there, and Lumbumbashi, right. and, there, and, and all of the interest in that. Well, it was, it was, that was my, my wife tells me it was Zaire at that time. Correct. It's no longer Zaire, dear. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I get, I get foreign affairs advice at, even at home. Well, that brings up another question about the Congo, because I understand that the Congo entered into one of those uh, Chinese uh, infrastructure agreements. And are they, are they continuing to be able to service that debt? I don't know. I don't know either. I have not seen it in the news. The big news item has been Zambia and then some of the countries in Southeast Asia, the Sri Lankan project and Malaysia. Those are the three that may have been made the international press. I think this thing hasn't played out yet. So. How long do you think it's going to take for it to play out? Hmm, another 10 years at least. Okay. Don't that's you think so? Of, These projects have a lot of money. money. But this big dam they're building on the Blue Nile in Ethiopia, I think some of the power proje projects I showed you are connected with that. I mean, you know, it's a long time to complete these projects, but that must be all Chinese funding on that project. Well, well just technology. remember, I, I assume that you mentioned this, but, you know, what's driving this whole thing is the, 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 the foreign, foreign, foreign currency reserves that the Chinese built up in their massive expansion as an exporter. And this, they didn't know what to do with the money. I mean, they, they bought all the US bonds that they wanted and they probably were over, are, are, are overly exposed in that regard. And our treasury can take care of that by just printing more money. Uh, but they, they, had, they had to find ways in which to use this money. And internal affairs is an issue. You, you would have thought that they would have done much more in terms of internal affairs than they did in terms of this large, very ambitious program, the BRI. 
when the Japanese had similar problems in the 80s and a lot of that money got squandered in, in bad investments. And I think the same thing is going to happen with the China. A lot of these things aren't going to pay off. They're going to be loans or terms are going to be renegotiated, renegotiated down. And the Africans are getting a good, good deal out of it. And meanwhile, no one else is, nobody else is offering help. We're well, certainly not offering help. That, that goes back to the, the Zara. Uh, no one else would, was willing to do it. And I, I wouldn't have been able to drink, uh, take a, two coolers of beer with me on a trip to, to Dar es Salaam. Have you worked in Africa, Carl? Yes, I was a Peace Corps volunteer to begin with in West Africa. My goodness. And, uh, also in, in Zaire. And then I worked in North Africa and Egypt, uh, Tunisia and Egypt. What language were you speaking? French and English. And I couldn't deal with Arabic. I can tell you that Peace Corps volunteers are amongst the best of young Americans in, in, uh, in foreign, uh, foreign environments, much better than diplomats, even though we get much more training because you are so immersed. Yeah, I think that the, the Peace Corps was a really good deal for, uh, was a better deal for the states, for the US than it was for the host country in many cases. I was, a little, I've been a little bit critical of it as, as, uh, as uh, middle-class uh, welfare uh, sending young, bright uh, people with no experience to teach English. Yeah, I was in a very rare program. I was in a skilled trades program. Whoa, that, One. that was, that was what, what year was that? 65, 60, wow. 65, 67. Wow. Because I know they tried that later when they would put skilled people and they tended to be much older. Yeah, we were slightly older. Okay. Yeah. Well, aren't, aren't we all? <laughs> <laughs> well, we were slightly older than the BA generalists that they were using. <laughs> yes. yes. Well, you know, American diplomats, we get, uh, depending on the country, we get anywhere from uh, six months to uh, two years of language training before we go into a, a particular country. And, uh, and then you begin your study again when you get there. Yes. And when you leave, you're lucky if you reach the level of professional fluency that would only make people shudder. <laughs> the Peace Corps had pretty good language training. Yeah, well, you're right. You're right there. I mean, we, we live in a very American cocoon in that respect. The embassy is a cocoon of mm -hmm. sorts, even though we're out and about in the, in, in the military. If those who are abroad and I was in the military as well. Uh, and I was on the island of Crete and I learned of some, some Greek. I even, in fact, I took lessons in, in Greek while I was there. And uh, it's, it's like studying, studying the language in, uh, in American university. You, you learn it, you study it as an intellectual exercise with the possibility that you may be able to read a little bit to, for graduate school, uh, but you're not gonna speak it really. Yeah. Okay, we have time for one more question if, or comment if anybody wants to jump in. Um, I, I just wanted to say, um, I remember looking at a map of the globe uh, at night. Um, I guess it was from a satellite or something, but you could see how much light was coming from different parts of the world. <laughs> and, and, you know, I think about Africa, like there's no light coming from Africa, but right. it's all on this side. And I, and I keep wondering as I was reading this, you know, with China going in and helping them, what's going to happen? <laughs> what's going to happen? I don't know. Worry about, I worry about energy and, having enough for everybody. One of the things that someone, that an a, a, a African politician told me, you're complaining about pollution at, in your country. We weren't into uh, at the climate change at the time. 
but you're worried about pollution. We would love to have your pollution. So that's, that's the thing as, as more development occurs, the stress on the globe is going to be even greater. And you can certainly see it in China, the, the air pollution there, everything you read about it, it's worse. Well, Rick, thank you very much for letting me join you. Okay, we're gonna switch gears now. And uh, next week we're gonna be uh, starting our DVD roundtable discussion. So it'll be a little different. We'll be watching the DVDs from the Foreign Policy Association um, and then having some dialogue about it. So um, I hope you can join us. Next week's topic is going to be the coldest war toward a return to greater power competition in the Arctic. So I hope you can join us next week. Um, we've got the rest of our topics on the screen. If um, you want to take a look at those. And I want to thank everybody. I want to thank Rick first for a very enter an interesting and informational discussion about China and Africa. And I want to thank everybody for participating and asking great questions. And we hope to see you next week. Thank you. Goodbye. Have a great evening. Goodbye. Thank you very much for attending and I appreciate it very much. The chance to learn a lot from getting ready for this. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.